have this uh, discussion across uh, sites. Um, we have a special guest today, uh, Robert Daly, who is the director of the Kissinger Center on China and the United States at the Wilson Center. Um, he has a, a very interesting and distinguished uh, career. He uh, began work in US-China relations as uh, a diplomat with the Foreign Service at the US Embassy in Beijing in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, after leaving the Foreign Service, um, he became pretty well known as a television personality um, in China. Um, he is also um, frequently a commentator on NPR, C-SPAN, BBC, The Voice of America, and uh, other international uh, media. Um, he's interpreted for Chinese and American leaders, including uh, Jiang Zemin and Jimmy Carter. And an interesting fact for um, the HNC audience is that he is a previous American co-director of the Hopkins Nanjing Center from, I think, 2001 to 2007. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So uh, that was a big time of transition uh, as well. So uh, we're very happy to have him uh, speaking to us today. Um, and he will be um, talking about the uh, decoupling of uh, American and global supply chains from China. And the title is The Emergence of Separate Knowledge and Information Systems uh, Condemn the U.S. and China to Mutual Alienation. So the That's actually point. the subtitle. That's the subtitle. The title is The Breaking Point. The subtitle is the emergence of separate knowledge and information systems condemn the U.S. and China to mutual uh, alienation. So um, he, he will be speaking and then um, please hold your questions until afterwards. Um, we have a uh, Q&A function below where you can type your question and then we can uh, collect questions and have them in the Q&A afterwards. Um, as you may notice, your, everyone's microphones are muted at the moment. That prevents any, any background noise. Uh, but when you type your question, uh, John Urban will be moderating at the end. So at this point, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Robert. Thanks, Adam. If you could just remind me, uh, how, how long is our session this morning? Um, we have, I think we have 90 minutes total. Okay, so as long as we build in a good Q&A session at the end, that would be good. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. It's, it's very good to be with all of you. I, I wish I know who I was with. I, maybe I can get that list at the end. But there, there is a list on the right side. You can probably access it on the participants. Oh, okay, I'll look, I'll look at that. There are 41 I people, I think. Yeah. Speak at the same time, but um, always very, very happy to work with uh, SAIS uh, and with the Hopkins Nanjing Center. Those six years, 2001 to 2007, uh, at Hopkins Nanjing were really a, a golden time uh, for me professionally, but also for the whole family. So I hope that this finds all of you uh, hunkered down and, and healthy wherever you are. Thanks for turning, uh, tuning in, especially those of you in the United States for whom it's relatively early on a Saturday morning. Before uh, I start the, the talk proper, a, not so much a, a disclaimer as an observation, because most of what I'm going to say today uh, is fairly gloomy uh, about US-China relations. I've been struck every day over the past few months uh, by how much we're caught up in the United States, and I think it's probably true in China and around the world, in the tyranny of the now. You know, this coronavirus has come on relatively rapidly and is having a very strong you know, social, medical, economic impacts. Uh, it's practically all that you read about or hear about. And all of the headlines seem to have been written uh, by the prophet Jeremiah, for whom you know the, the, the brutal end was always just around the corner. Uh, and there's an awful lot of purple prose and a lot of exaggeration and a lot of prophecy. Uh, I don't know where this goes or when we come out of it or where we will find ourselves. Uh, but I do think that we are underestimating the very powerful tendency uh, for societies and people to want to return to the normal, to return to established patterns. And so there's a lot of, you know, was this Xi Jinping's Chernobyl moment? Is this the end of the Trump administration? Is the whole global war, you know, the world order been turned on its head? Is black, white, and is up now, down? And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so, and I don't want this talk to be a part of that general sort of uh, jeremiad. Uh, nevertheless, I do think that tendencies that we had seen before the coronavirus in US-China relations have now accelerated, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, in calling this talk the breaking point, I'm thinking of uh, David M. Lampton, who was for many years the head of the SICE China program, uh, and a speech he gave in 2015, which he then called the tipping point. He was very alarmed then about the course of US-China relations. And by the tipping point, what he meant was, this is a quote, our respective fears 
are nearer to outweighing our hopes than at any time since normalization. So he said this obviously um, you know, years before we thought about a pandemic, but even then our respective fears are nearer to outweighing our hopes than at any time since normalization. And I think that the uh, subsequent years have borne out his fears, but I also think we've gone from this tipping point uh, that he identified to a real breaking point. Uh, things have probably gone even worse than he'd anticipated at that time. And I do think that while it's a recent way of speaking about the relationship, it's a useful way of speaking about it. This question of decoupling or to go a number of forms of decoupling were well established before the coronavirus and have accelerated. And so what I want to talk about is, are the established patterns of decoupling and then some new ones, which I think are the straws that, that break the camel's back. So we've all heard a great deal about supply chain decoupling, uh, which is now well underway and which is accelerating. It's unlikely to be, it's almost certainly not going to be total, uh, but it's going to have major impacts uh, for costs, for manufacturers, for consumers, for the efficiency of markets. And this again predates, as you know, uh, COVID-19. On the US side, I think we can trace it back to the summer of 2017, when President Trump issued an executive order calling for a study of what was called domestic defense supply chain resiliency. It was the idea that the American uh, military supply chain should not depend on other countries, but especially China, for essential components, raw materials, or technology. The executive order called for a study which has now been completed by the military uh, and so we are mapping out ways in which the United States will have to develop or open up new industries for domestic uh, defense, for defense purposes. But of course, those defense supply chains are really inextricably linked to non-defense or commercial supply chains. And that's been a major focus of decoupling prior to the trade war. Then, of course, we get the trade war. And I won't recount that because I think you've all probably followed that very closely. Uh, but it has accelerated the decoupling trend, and that was has been further exacerbated, of course, by the coronavirus itself with repeated calls and legislation in the United States uh, to bring especially biopharmaceutical and medical equipment manufacturers back to the United States. Depending on what part of the medical supply chain you look, for, look at, uh, America is dependent for about 80 to 95% uh, of not only its medicines, but actually the reagents, uh, the, the precursor materials, the basic raw materials of medicine, uh, all uh, are, are coming from China. Our ibuprofen comes from China. And I think you are, you are going to see a very rapid uh, new sort of decoupling in that major industry. This is ongoing. Uh, and it is changing uh, American fundamental thinking about the nature of markets uh, and the domestic and worldwide economy. I would refer you to a speech uh, that Marco Rubio, certainly somebody we can safely categorize as a China hawk, a speech he gave at Catholic University uh, in November of last year. It was called Catholic Social Doctrine and the Dignity of Work. And it was followed up by a December speech at the National Defense University, in which building on that Catholic University speech, Rubio called for, quote, a 21st century pro-American industrial policy. Rubio was calling for an industrial policy. Uh, there's, this is widely opposed within the Republican Party, but more people are beginning to agree with him, forcing uh, manufacturers to come back to the United States to produce their goods here is a form of industrial policy. It is, is a violation of free market orthodoxy, but he's, Rubio is calling for this and it's directly aimed at countering China's rise. So we see concern about China uh, coming up against Republican Party, especially uh, mar you know, market economics and, and market orthodoxy. Uh, Secretary of State Pompeo spoke to the leadership of Silicon Valley in January of this year. And this was you know, really on the cusp of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. But he asked America's technological leaders in very ex explicitly in the face of China's rise to be both profitable and patriotic patriotic, meaning that their manufacturers, their activities should not strengthen China vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Now, how they're to follow that call to be uh, profitable and patriotic, I have no idea. I think they don't have any idea either, but it's um, the politics of this and even the Republican economics of it are changing. So supply chain decoupling is, is the first thing we generally talk about when we think of 
the United States and China becoming disintegrated. But it's not just uh, manufactured goods. Of course, tech systems decoupling was also well underway before coronavirus. You have all been following uh, American attempts to limit the scope of Huawei uh, and ZTE uh, in the United States, but also around the world. Uh, the claim of our diplomats to uh, most other nations is that letting Huawei or ZTE or other Chinese components into your 5G uh, kit, your telecoms equipment, uh, is going to expose these nations to uh, Chinese spying. Uh, they will then be, uh, they can be cut off by China in times of uh, conflict through various forms of cyber warfare. The claim goes, um, because China requires by law all companies to supply whatever data the government requires, uh, the claim goes, uh, no Huawei or ZTE system can be regarded as secure. And it's not just Huawei and ZTE. We see it uh, with DJI. Uh, which is the Shenzhen company, uh, which has about 75% of global market share for aerial drones. We see it even with something like TikTok, uh, which may seem fairly innocuous and which many of you may have as an app on your cell phones, which is also um, on Congress's agenda now. And the concern here is that TikTok, a Chinese company, can use this platform to collect data on Americans, which it can then later use against them. So there is an attempt to get Chinese tech out of the United States uh, to the greatest extent possible and even to have other nations reject it as well. But it's not just about telecoms. Uh, there are increasing calls in the United States to, for American companies and American tech to have nothing to do with any part of the Chinese surveillance state, which is being built out at a great rate. Artificial intelligence, facial recognition, uh, surveillance cameras, Companies that sell any components uh, that go into this equipment are now, uh, to use Pompeo's language, viewed as unpatriotic and are increasingly called upon not to sell to China and in some cases are being forbidden to sell to China. Uh, more and more Chinese companies are placed on the entity list, meaning that they can't be involved in American systems, but also that American companies cannot sell to them. So anything in telecoms is now suspect. Anything used in China for surveillance is suspect. Uh, any technology that could possibly aid in the buildup of the Chinese military increasingly is something that American companies are not able to sell to. So that, that covers a great deal of technology, but it's even broader than that. Uh, everybody on Capitol Hill has read Kai Fu Lee's book, Our Artificial Intelligence AI Superpowers. And so these people in Congress now uh, understand, or in some cases think that they understand, that the key to prevailing in US-China competition is artificial intelligence, and that the oil of AI is data. Therefore, increasingly, and this isn't just in speeches, it's also in draft legislation, any kind of technological cooperation with China that provides data sets to China is also increasingly suspect. So supply chain couple, uh, decoupling, tech system decoupling, and now we're also on the cusp of financial system decoupling. Uh, which could be even more um, disruptive to you know, global trade and global investment regimes than supply chain decoupling. China, uh, for its part, is very interested in challenging the American-led SWIFT system of global payments. Uh, as you know, it, the, things like the SWIFT system, the status of the United States dollar as really the only global reserve currency, uh, give the United States international levers that other countries don't have. The United States can use the SWIFT payment system to carry out secondary sanctions against other countries, against companies in other countries uh, who are doing things that we don't like, for example, trading with North Korea or with Iran. Uh, by cutting them off from the SWIFT system, we slow down their ability uh, to participate in the global exchange uh, system and it slows down their companies. Um, this is a hegemonic power of sorts that the United States has. And China is uh, increasingly challenging that and working to internationalize the RMB. I don't mean to imply that that's all nefarious. It's you know, perfectly understandable uh, why China would, would wish to do this. But it's nevertheless a challenge to the existing system and a decoupling. It tends toward the formation of two separate systems worldwide. We also see growing efforts, again, with legislation that is moving in Congress, and I think is likely to move even more quickly through Congress, 
uh, once the coronavirus slows down, efforts to keep Chinese companies off the American stock market uh, and actually to delist companies that are already listed on the grounds that Chinese companies listed on the American stock market, which are getting capital from American investors, and therefore in Congress's view, by getting capital from American investors, they are helping to build China's comprehensive national power at American expense. And the critique is that Chinese companies, by and large, do not really meet Wall Street's standards for transparency and accuracy in their quarterly and annual reports. Chinese companies are not transparent, they're not up to the standard, and therefore they should be delisted. This is what uh, legislation moving through the Congress now uh, is calling for. And in, in many cases, it would appear that this is a, a legitimate critique. Chinese companies are not as transparent. The, generally speaking, the accounting is not as accurate. Of course, the United States was very uh, glad to let them on list on American uh, markets uh, earlier because we wanted a piece, right? This was, this was um, high return on investment, it was thought, for American investors. And so we tended to overlook in the early days uh, the non-transparent reporting from Chinese companies. But in keep, we're, we wanna cut Chinese companies off from American stock markets. Of course, the United States has always had limited access to Chinese equities markets, but there is also uh, action now in Congress to try to get American investors out of Chinese stocks. Uh, many of the large American funds, including most American states, uh, government personnel's retirement funds, are invested by state managers through indexed funds in, among other things, Chinese stocks, uh, somewhat indirectly. And the reason that uh, American systems like the California system, which is enormous, called CalPERS, uh, is invested in China is because they need to make a 4% return on investment in order to pay the retirements of American uh, public, public officials, of American state officials. So that's very important. People need a return on investment. So we look to China for that. This is now uh, under attack. And the idea is that American government workers, American workers generally, the American military in particular, which are also involved in this, sh should not be putting their money into Chinese companies who are again involved in the Chinese military, the Chinese surveillance state, the same list that I've already handed out. And there's a broader critique that Americans shouldn't be investing in China at all, again, because of the idea that anything that is to China's benefit is now to America's detriment and is therefore unpatriotic. I was involved in a case um, about two, maybe two months ago. The uh, CFO <clears throat> of the California uh, personnel CalPERS fund who leads the calls on where to invest their retirement savings uh, is an American citizen of Chinese origin, very good at his job, uh, who had been working for CalPERS for a few years, who then went back to China uh, to work for a major Chinese government fund, again, to make the investment calls for them under the Thousand Talents program. He did this openly. He hadn't hidden this. He wasn't double dipping. He then came back to California and is now very effectively leading the, that fund for the state of California. And he was attacked a few weeks ago by a congressman uh, from Indiana who said that this guy was you know, a spy and should be fired immediately because he had participated in Thousand Talents. Uh, CalPERS was very, very happy with his work um, and sort of mounted a, a pretty strong, robust uh, defense of this guy and pointed out that this uh, Indiana congressman, his own retirement was invested for the same reasons also in Chinese funds. So that seemed to go to ground briefly, but it will be back. It's another kind of pressure for decoupling of the financial systems in addition to supply chains and technological systems. But again, pre-COVID, it doesn't stop there. We had also seen the beginnings of decoupling of US and Chinese civil society uh, systems. And the, the leading factor here was China's uh, still relatively new foreign NGO law, which was designed to greatly curtail and eliminate the activities of foreign NGOs in China who are seen uh, you know, under Xi Jinping and had been seen before Xi Jinping to some degree as a sort of fifth column uh, that was used by the West and America in particular to soften up China and to prepare it for greater American influence. China 
watched uh, with great shock the color revolutions and the activities of places like the National Endowment for Democracy. And it tends to see places like the Ford Foundation and other American NGOs as likewise spreading a kind of American infection in China. And so uh, non-government, American and international non-governmental organizations activities in China uh, have been greatly restricted. We see on the American side also, and I'm sure you've, you've been following this, growing American concern about Chinese infection. This is usually called the influence debate, concern about Chinese influence, the activities of Chinese United Front organizations in the United States and the growing influence therefore of the Chinese Communist Party on American institutions and communities. And there's growing pushback uh, against that kind of act, Chinese activity in the United States, uh, growing suspicion. And it's gotten so bad now during the coronavirus that even medical philanthropy is seen as widely suspect. Chinese donations of face masks in particular, but also the sourcing of respirators, ventilators, uh, test kits are seen as a kind of, not as philanthropy, uh, not as a, a donation or a public good from China, but as a way for China to uh, build its soft power and spread its international influence. And there's tremendous suspicion about that kind of activity as well. So that's all worrisome, decoupling of supply chains, tech, financial system, civil society. Uh, but what I think really brings us from the tipping point that David Lampton talked about to a real breaking point is a new form of decoupling, which isn't, I think, being talked about or reported on enough, which is the decoupling of information and knowledge systems between the United States and China. By the decoupling of information systems, I mean primarily uh, traditional and social media, but also things like film, uh, you know, books and magazines, uh, gaming. You know, gaming is, is very important. It's, it's more profitable than Hollywood. And gaming is emerging as the common shared experience of young people all over the world. Gaming itself is now censored and is starting to separate off into two different systems. You may have seen just yesterday uh, that protesters in Hong Kong have been using the game Animal Crossing, where you can build and manipulate an environment to embed anti-Chinese Communist Party messages. Uh, and China is now looking at banning Animal Crossing. Uh, games are designed to meet the censorship regimes uh, of uh, the Chinese government. And so Chinese and American young people play different games. I know this can sound like lightweight stuff, just as TikTok can be seen as lightweight stuff. Um, but as the father of 2018 and, and now 12 year old, uh, this is sort of the common currency of young people all over the world. And they're increasingly not able to play the same games, which have narratives in them, and they're not able to play together. Um, so I'm, you know, gaming is, is important. Uh, but it's not just that they have, you know, separate games and separate narratives. Because of the increasing uh, decoupling of these in, of information systems, which we've seen with the tit for tat expulsions of uh, journalists and uh, from the you know, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post from China, uh, we have seen um, uh, Chinese party media have their uh, personnel ranks cut dramatically from about 160 in the United States down to 100. We're evolving separate information systems. And it's actually, this entails separate histories. We, we're not telling our national stories or the world stories with reference to each other. Uh, we already have a highly politicized educational system in China, which has become more so under Xi Jinping which tells the history not only of China, but of, of the United States and the world radically differently. And that gap seems to be spreading so that we refer in our diplomacy, in our claims uh, to, global, to global governance, we refer to separate histories. We refer to different sets of contemporary facts and increasingly between the United States and China, uh, we disregard each other's facts and it's, this is, you know, this term fake news is, is used to simply discard uh, any, any fact or argument that is inconvenient to us. And this is happening between the United States and China. And we refer to in our arguments, in our information, to different kinds of authority to verify facts and to determine truth. And this is making argument, persuasion, discussion uh, increasingly difficult. I'm involved in a 
uh, conference now that we're doing via Zoom with American China watchers and Chinese America watchers, people who've known each other for decades and have really very high mutual regard for each other. Very hard to find a common vocabulary, a common narrative, any foundation upon which to try to analyze what's happening in the relationship and try to retard its continued deterioration. So this US-China decoupling of information systems, where does this go? This is an imperfect analogy, but I, I wanna try to make clear what I mean here. Think of the red states and the blue states in the United States of America and how great the divide, the gap in the telling of history, the recognition of facts, the invocation of authorities for truth has become, even within the United States, between red states with a, broadly speaking, broad strokes here, Fox News dominated narrative and telling about the meaning of the United States and blue states with an NBC narrative. It's become very hard in the United States um, to have a conversation across that gap. So think of that red state, blue state divide. And now imagine that the red states and blue states have separate territories and very large armies and both want their vision to prevail. You know, how do you think that would go? This is the danger of different information and knowledge systems. Now, you know, you may think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. It's not that bad. Um, watch the daily news. You know, just over the past few days, we've seen the Wuhan blogger, Fang Fang, who'd been very popular in China, now being attacked precisely because she is being read in America and, the, and in the West and making China look bad. She's being attacked not because of her critique in the first instance, not because of her facts. She'd been broadly supported for that. She's being attacked because the, the attacks claim. She is sort of aiding and abetting the enemy by speaking truth as she sees it, and she's being silenced. In the United States, we saw yesterday, deeply concerning, the White House criticizing the Voice of America for a factual report on the opening up of the city of Wuhan after the quarantine. This was a factual report on something that is of concern to people all over the world. The coronavirus originated there. We all now know where Wuhan is. We know that it had been in lockdown. Now it's opening up an absolutely legitimate, I would argue even necessary report by the Voice of America yesterday attacked by the White House for spreading the accusation was Chinese Communist Party propaganda. And the reason they're accused of this is because they uh, broadcast a video of the light show on the side of buildings in Wuhan as, as, as Wuhan opened up and had a celebratory view of it. Uh, and again, this happened factually. They were showing the video of this. Um, there was no claim in the report uh, that Wuhan had handled everything wonderfully or that China hadn't covered up the facts in Wuhan. It was merely a report on opening and VOA is now under attack from its own government, which was in a newsletter that went out to the American people said, VOA spends yours, the taxpayer money, and instead of telling America's story, they're broadcasting Chinese Communist Party propaganda. So this telling of America's story Yes, that's always been a, a part of VOA's mandate, but it's secondary to providing objective and reliable news. So now we see this language of telling America's story, which means telling America's story only as a certain political class in America wants it to be understood. And we have the same thing in China with uh, Xi Jinping saying all Chinese media, Xindang, they're all surnamed party, and their job is to tell China's story, to tell Chinese stories. And what Xi Jinping means, of course, is that media's job is to present reality as the Chinese Communist Party sees it and have it accepted globally as such, separate information systems, separate narratives. And of course, knowledge systems, we see this as well. And I'm referring here primarily to universities where we see uh, growing forms of decoupling uh, as the United States gets more and more suspicious about Chinese students at American universities, uh, particularly those of them who are in the STEM field. Because of technological decoupling, uh, there are growing calls, uh, have been both from the White House and from Congress, to uh, limit the numbers of Chinese students or the levels at which Chinese students can study uh, certain fields. The latest National Defense Authorization Act has set up two commissions, one in the White House 
and one at the National Academies of Science, Medicine, and Engineering in Washington. And they are looking at what, what areas of knowledge, what disciplines should uh, be inaccessible to students from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Cuba, and at what levels. Increasingly, the academic systems are also decoupling from each other. Uh, and this, I think, the decoupling of information and knowledge systems ends up resulting in a mutual alienation that is even more dangerous than the partial decoupling of supply chains. Uh, and it is only getting worse. Uh, it's getting worse, of course, because the United States and China have, are already engaged in a global competition to be the primary nation shaping security architectures, trade and investment regimes, the development, marketization, and regulation of emerging tech, very important, but also norms and practices and value systems worldwide. And against that background of global competition, which is already an enormous new geostrategic pressure, not only on the US and China, but on every country, we now have the emergence of separate or decoupled information and knowledge systems. Why is this so dangerous? And again, think about the American red state, blue state issue. It tends to lead to echo chambers uh, in which there is no criticism, no comparison, no feedback, and in which Americans are telling America's story to Americans who then clap, and China is telling Chinese stories to Chinese who then clap, with no uh, casting of these two stories in contrast with each other, which has been what public diplomacy and much of US-China engagement has been about. And it's been, I think, I would argue constructive for both countries. That is beginning to happen. There's an echo chamber problem. The decoupling of knowledge systems, of course, stymies the growth of innovation and knowledge. It sets scholars who should be working together against each other. And these separate knowledge systems driven by geostrategic concern, um, clearly in the coronavirus case, is precluding the kinds of cooperation that we need very, very badly. The coronavirus um, comes close to the alien invasion fantasy where you've got the nations of Earth warring against each other and then because of an alien threat, they realize they have common interests and they band together and you've all seen Independence Day, you know how that goes. Uh, this is a test of, of sorts of that fantasy, clear common interests, and we're flunking the test, both on the Chinese side and on the United States side. And then, of course, this um, separate information system, separate histories, separate sets of facts also tends to lead to, um, and I know this is somewhat PC language, but I think it's appropriate in this case, it tends to lead toward dehumanization of the other, uh, which makes violence easier to contemplate. Uh, we have seen tremendous growth in anger during the coronavirus crisis of Americans toward Chinese and Chinese toward Americans. And these are countries, you know, I, I know that China is not inherently anti-American. Uh, neither is America anti-Chinese at all at the, at the, at the personal and, and, and cultural levels. Quite the opposite. And this is one of the things that the Hopkins Nanjing Center uh, has always attested to. But anger of populations has gone up and it's been prompted by bad information and by conspiracy theories promulgated by leaders. We now have Senator Cotton of Arkansas and others in the United States uh, calling China the evil empire, uh, invoking you know, Reagan's description of the Soviet Union. Uh, China's formal diplomatic language tends to be a little bit more restrained, traditional, um, and perhaps polite. Uh, but that same mood, that same you know, sense of, of deep distrust toward the United States, I think is as active in China as it is in the United States. And of course, it's not just China and the US. We've been speaking in a binational way, but other countries share these same concerns. Uh, last year, the European Commission labeled China as a systemic rival. So that's where I think we are. Let's go back to um, Lampton's tipping point speech and his quote. Again, remember, he said, our respective fears are nearer to outweighing our hopes than at any time since normalization. In 2015, he used the plural pronoun, right? Our. There was an us. There was an assumed we, a commonality when he spoke of US-China relations. With the decoupling of information and knowledge systems, my fear is that, that, that we lose that. We lose any ability to speak of our respective fears, our hopes, that, that sense of commonality and common cause uh, is gone. We see this in our diplomacy as well. On the American side, we have something new at the State Department called the Global Engagement Center. 
uh, and I began my career uh, in the Foreign Service with what was then called uh, the United States Information Agency. It was the, the public diplomacy arm of the Foreign Service, and we were told to tell America's story, but we were also trained to tell that story, wart, we said warts and all. You know, there was a, there was a confidence that you, if we, you were completely open and talking about America's failures and missteps, uh, as well as what America was doing well, there was confidence that on balance, foreign publics would be more impressed than otherwise. And our public diplomacy used to be about making arguments and presenting American culture, presenting American scholarship in discussion with foreign experts and foreign publics as, as a positive, a putting forth of a positive narrative about the United States. The new Global Engagement Center at the State Department, uh, which is fairly widely funded, is about sending American experts to all the other countries of the world, not to talk about how America works and what America is struggling against, but to talk about nefarious Chinese actions in those countries. So that, that may be necessary in many of these cases as a component of our public diplomacy, but it shouldn't become the focus. You've sort of got this, to me, it's sort of Xiaoren, you know, it's a small minded skulking around telling people not to play with China because they're jerks rather than presenting United States culture, successes, ideas, uh, which is the business we used to be in. Um, it's a different kind of diplomacy. And on the Chinese side, we see uh, people like Zhao Lijian and many of China's ambassadors all over the world who have also gone uh, in their diplomacy into an attack mode, uh, accusing, very quick to accuse other nations of racism against China for any critique of Chinese actions, uh, and very quick to attack. We see this with um, the ambassador to Chinese ambassador to Great Britain, uh, Liu Xiaoming, uh, who uses op-eds in the FT. A lot of these uh, Chinese ambassadors are using Twitter, which of course is banned in China, and they seem absolutely tone deaf to the irony of using Twitter overseas while uh, banning it within China, but let that go. But you see people like you know, Ambassador Liu and others all over the world, in Scandinavia, in Canada, uh, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, um, attacking any critique of China in those nations, not with an argument, not with a discussion, but, and again, go to the FT and look at Liu Xiaoming's um, op-eds if you don't believe me, but simply with two points. Um, one, shut up. Two, you're wrong, so think what we want you to think. There's a much more aggressive Chinese diplomacy and a more aggressive American diplomacy as well. I think it derives from this failure of any sense of commonality that comes from the decoupling of information and knowledge systems. So this has all come about, which at the time, um, fairly quickly. You know, we had been involved with each other. We had been integrating with each other since 1979. And even since 1979, for about 40 years, the United States and China, for all their differences, had been integrating knowledge and information systems as China opened up. China's opening and reform, and, and I hope we have um, some young Chinese scholars on, on this call, and I hope that they will uh, raise questions or raise critiques or you know, say whatever you want to say. But um, it was the case until fairly recently. Was it the Beijing Olympics? Was it 2010? Was it the advent of Xi Jinping? People argue about that. But for most of China's period of opening and reform, it was understood in China itself that China was opening to what? They were opening to established global systems and practices. And the macro narrative in China was about Chinese change, Chinese transition, gradual and to be sure, directed by Chinese for Chinese purposes, no, no, no question about this, and to be adapted by China for Chinese use. But it was a story of opening two established systems and practices. And there was an excitement in China about that. There was an optimism about that. Reform and opening had been understood for most of the time since 1979 as aspirational. If it had a Chinese tussle, but it was an aspiring of China to open to something that was established. And this included uh, until relatively recently, again, it, it tends to drop out around the time 2008 Beijing Olympics, but the telling about the meaning of China's opening and reform, even by the Chinese government, 
included a regular claim that China was moving toward democracy and transparency and representative government. Uh, it, the, the, the claim was always that China was not yet ready, but that that was the aspiration that China was moving toward. And I don't think that that was um, cynical or manipulative. We're, in, in the United States now, uh, the, the very hardline sort of China hawks say that those claims were always simply lies uh, to dupe Americans, to sucker them into raising a tiger, which would someday be as big as the United States. I think that's, that's revisionist history. That I say having lived through this, there was a real excitement in China about opening up and progressing toward uh, a Chinese version of more liberal democratic values. The United States supported that. They thought it was good. That was a shared narrative. China's reform and opening benefits all was the shared narrative when we had one. That has changed. Uh, China's reform and opening are now understood within China and in the rest of the world, reform and opening are understood as instrumental to the development of China's comprehensive national power, which entails the legitimization of Chinese Communist Party domestic practices in the global sphere and internationally. This is why now within the United States, any activity um, by foreign corporations, by NGOs, by American investors, by American universities that benefits China is seen by many in Washington as contributing to Chinese power and the promulgation of Chinese practices. And it is for this reason that within China, any objection from the United States or European or Southeast Asian or any nation to the spread of Chinese illiberal influence is seen in Beijing as anti-China, as an attempt to contain China, and as an attempt to defend American hegemony, uh, despite the fact that America is a declining power. This is so very starkly different narratives uh, in, both, in both countries, um, with very little overlap between them. I think what I'll do, uh, I've usual has have over prepared. So I think I'll, what I'll do is stop there because we really want to have uh, a long discussion and a chance to hear your questions, your comments. Um, and I would especially uh, hope that, that uh, we've got some Chinese students who are listening and I hope that you would feel free. If you're at the HNC, of course, you must feel free uh, to be involved very comfortably in a critical discussion, uh, which can include, um, attacking the lecturer, which is quite all right. Adam. Okay, thank you very much for that, that very interesting uh, talk. I guess we can open up for some questions. Uh, if you see at the bottom of the uh, window, you can type questions in there that we can uh, collect. Uh, Robert, can you see the questions at the bottom or not? I can. Um, I'm going to have to lean in. So I'm going to, so the first question I see where it says, sir, it sounds like you're saying this decoupling is a tragedy. From the U.S. perspective, what information about China's handling about the coronavirus, military affairs, human rights, or any other issue would make you consider to, uh, decoupling to be a necessary tragedy or simply necessary? Right. Good question. Um, have I implied that decoupling is a tragedy? I guess in, in, in part I have. Um, and I consider it the, the tragic element uh, is that you've got the world's two most powerful nations um, increasingly angry at each other. They're increasingly involved in an arms race and we're moving quickly back toward the doctrine of mutual assured destruction. We are alienated from each other. We are failing to cooperate with each other, even in our common interests. And we increasingly uh, don't have the pleasure of each other's company. That is a human tragedy on the face of it. But there's a secondary question, which I think you, know, you, you raise very appropriately appropriately here. It's a human tragedy, but is it a strategic necessity? And uh, in, to some degree, I think it is now a strategic necessity of sorts, because this is not all about emotion and fear. It's also about really incommensurate interests, which derive in part from very different value systems in the two countries. Um, in early 2018, in 2017, we had the national security strategy, which said that China and Russia, especially China, were now a greater threat to American security than uh, terrorism and threats from non-state actors. In January of 2018, 
Then Secretary of Defense Mattis unrolled the National Defense Strategy. The National Security Strategy identifies threats. The National Defense Strategy lays out the military's response to those threats. And Mattis said, very interesting statement for a Secretary of Defense, he said, uh, it's not foreordained that America gets to prevail in this competition, but we must prevail, he said, if the values of the Enlightenment are to endure. That's interesting. He didn't say to protect American interests. He did not say to defend the sacred American homeland. It was if the values of the Enlightenment are to endure. This really is, very broadly speaking, a competition between a more or less international rules-based order. Now that's, that's, a, that's a shaky phrase, and some people who use that speak of a rules-based order as though it's established, uncontested, complete, unevolving, it's, it's none of those things. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a competition between a rules-based order and Chinese Communist Party illiberal practices cast over as much of the globe as they can be cast over. And so we do need to be vigilant, uh, and defensive in, and in many of these cases, and we need to go on the offensive in many of these cases. Uh, it is in America's very strong interest to prevent Chinese dominance of the Western Pacific, to call out and to counter China, the spread of Chinese illiberal practices. And so, yes, in some cases, uh, this human tragedy may be a strategic necessity. Uh, it's not being discussed in American politics, however, in those terms we get China is an existential threat, China is the evil empire, anything that benefits China is harmful to the United States. Uh, it's not a, a nuanced or even a very well-informed discussion. Let me, um, is China, next question. Do, 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 John, do you wanna to talk to raise these or do you want me to read them? What's the better way to do this? Here's what I can, I can I'll read some, so I'll, I'll pipe, pipe in now. So I can read the questions to you so you don't, you don't have to squint back and forth. All right. <laughs> and, then, and then after the, so we have three questions, we have, Questions we can lump in together, and then one for Mr. Yellow, uh, Mr. Tan, and then after that, um, we can welcome people to press the raise hand function, and then I will unmute you, and then you can ask the question live, which might be a little more um, engaging. So, so we have a few questions from Professor Curry from HNC. Um, he asked, you know, is China manipulating or managing its currency, the RMB? You know, and what do you mean by Chinese characteristics? And finally. Uh, do you have any um, any papers, research papers on China-U.S. relations decoupling that you think we should read that you would like to share? Okay, let's do let's do one question at a time because I'll, I'll just forget them. Um, does China manage or manipulate its currency? Uh, sure, of course it does. Uh, the question is how big a problem is that uh, in the sphere of all of these other problems that we've been describing? And I think that it's a, a pretty minor problem even pre the coronavirus. Uh, China's manipulation of its currency uh, was actually sustaining the value of the currency in a way that was in the United States interest. This was a bigger problem 15 or 20 years ago. It's also notable that what's called the phase one trade deal and in the Trump administration's negotiations with China generally, we are now asking China to manipulate its currency. Uh, we are asking China to sort of guarantee that it not decline in value too rapidly, although if it truly did a free float, which of course it won't, uh, it probably would have declined uh, at that time. So we are requesting now uh, a manipulated currency. We are also in our phase one trade deal and in our other requests to China and to other trading partners asking not for free trade, but for managed trade. Uh, so I, I don't think that the manipulated currency issue is a, a big one now. Um, it's still out there. Uh, there's a second question about what, what do I mean by Chinese characteristics? Um, right, this is the, what the Xi Jinping calls, you know, 中国的特色, or he likes to say what is in China's DNA. That's one of his uh, favorite metaphors. It's not so much what I mean by it, it's, it's what Xi Jinping and the Communist Party means by it. And if you go back and look at Xi Jinping's speeches, he invokes China's special characteristics and even China's wisdom as driving China's policy. And the claim is that because of China's history and because of the, the, the culture and the values uh, that have accompanied and emerged from this history, China is now driven to do certain things like seek regional primacy and tell its story to the world. And China is now capable of doing certain things 
like contributing more heavily to global governance. Xi Jinping invokes Chinese tradition and Chinese culture regularly in his speeches, far more than uh, any of his three predecessors has done. Uh, Mao Zedong did this to a degree, sometimes to, to you know, tear down and attack the tradition. But Xi Jinping places himself within the Chinese tradition and presents it as separate from the rest of, of you know, global tradition, the Enlightenment tradition, if you will. This is the claim that China is a sui generis. It's related to his claim that universal values don't exist or don't apply to China. China is a, a world set apart. And yet somehow, and this is where it's very inconsistent, Xi's rhetoric is very inconsistent, uh, even though universal values don't apply and China is a world unto itself that can only be judged by Chinese according to China's own historical and political criteria, yet China is also the source of a model which can be emulated by other nations. There's a, a disconnect there between the rejection of the universal, the embrace of Chinese characteristics, which is a, a form of Chinese exceptionalism. There's a gap between that and China's aspirations to global governance. She does try to bridge this. Uh, he says there are no such thing as universal values, but there are common values, which is related to Xi Jinping's claim that we're part of a community of common destiny. Well, excuse me, teacher, I have a question. What's the difference between a universal value and, and a common value? So China's special characteristics um, one way to think about it is China's version of exceptionalism and its claim that only Chinese can judge it by Chinese criteria and that all foreign critiques of China um, are therefore dismissible or, or, or irrelevant or derived from our need for continued hegemony or whatever it is. And then the last question was, what would I recommend on this? Why? You know what, let me get... Um, because everybody here is Hopkins, what I'll do, let, let me think on that one a little bit more. Um, is the, the, see the, the rate of deterioration in the relations has accelerated so quickly. There's been a lot of least recent writing. I'll, I'll send a list, if I can, maybe Adam to Adam or John to you know, broadcast out, um, rather than you know, yeah, grope for be, something. That would be pretty good to follow Rather up. than grope for something now, let, let me send you something. Mm -hmm. Next, next so the question, next question um, is from Yang Long Tan. I come from Singapore. Many countries like Singapore prefer to be not aligned to the US and China, or at least be aligned in different ways. Does this decoupling indicate that the space for these countries to balance both big powers has shrunk to the point where these countries have to choose one over another? And relatedly, does this indicate that we are headed toward a largely dichotomous US-China world order or do you see players like the EU or India possibly being able to play out and um, play some role as well? So um, one aspect of this question gets us into the realm of prophecy. and I don't have a crystal ball on this. But uh, yes, both China and the United States are putting increasing pressure on countries all over the world, not to make an absolute choice, uh, but to choose sides in specific instances as they relate to things like military basing agreements or build out of 5G systems. And obviously, uh, if it's true that all of these different kinds of systems are increasingly decoupling, it probably will make it harder for other nations to play the two great powers off against each other to get their own maximum benefit without being seen by either of the two powers as antagonistic. That's that's been the, the broad uh, foreign policy play for a number of countries. It's been the intelligent play uh, is to hedge and play off. I think it's going to get di more difficult to do that. Um, but getting into your prophecy question, I also think it's more essential than ever to do that because as the United States and China um, enter into you know, what, what I've called a long period of mutual alienation, and the fair question is, am I dodging using the phrase Cold War or something like a new Cold War? Uh, in saying that, and I have been very resistant to using that language, but clearly long-term deep distrust, mutual alienation, mutual assured destruction heads us in that direction. Uh, my own view is that it is uh, multilateralism, international, the internationalization of systems and the diversity of systems that saves us. Uh, one of the big mistakes you can make in talking about US-China relations is to speak as though they're the only two countries in the world. When you do that, it's really hard to avoid the conclusion that we're headed for conflict. 
But of course, we're not the only two countries in the world and neither country uh, can do everything that it would like to do. The power of both nations is highly constrained. Uh, and so I think that we do need to look to the mitigating factor of the rest of the world. I mean, the EU, you say, you know, India, Southeast Asia, it is their ability to play the countries off against each other that I think saves us. My own view, which is sort of uh, utopian and we clearly have no purchase in the current administration, uh, is that rather than asking nations to pick and choose, which we are doing, I've spent a lot of time with uh, European uh, diplomats um, and Southeast Asian diplomats in particular, and they all feel bullied behind closed doors by Chinese and Americans. We're, we're both guilty of this. Rather than wanting them to pick, um, we do need to be asking our partners and allies to not let themselves be coerced, to not make any exceptions for China. And frankly, they shouldn't be coerced by the United States either. If countries like India or Singapore feel that they have a good relationship with China on Singapore's terms, uncoerced, and a good relationship with the United States, uncoerced on Singapore's terms, that will necessarily involve all nations in networks of compromise and complexity, which are probably the best bulwark against a really stark Cold War style choosing of sides and a, a strict dichotomy between two global systems. So I, that's where I hope we end up, but uh, that's not a prediction. I'd, I'd like to interject here and, and actually pick up on a point that you just made. And I, I think this was implicit in the, the question you just answered as well about the, the rest of the world beyond this bilateral um, relationship. Because I mean, one thing that, and if you look at some of the projections you know, over the next 30, 50 years or so on, I mean, I think by, by almost any account, um, the, the total share of the world economy that is US or China or US and China combined is actually likely to shrink as a proportion right. of the total as, as other regions continue um, developing faster. Um, so, I mean, it, it seems on, on some level, the long-term story is going to be a kind of dispersion of global power of, of any kind. And I was wondering if this is not only a structural question, but also a kind of a cognitive question on both sides. I mean, can, can you imagine a reframing of this issue in the US or in the West in general in a way that would accept a kind of relative decline as long as certain global rules of openness are maintained? And on the Chinese side, can you imagine a scenario in which China's rise is seen as being engaging with that kind of flatter global landscape rather than the rise of a state as such? So I can imagine that kind of scenario. The problem is that that scenario is imaginary. Um, I do think this is going to be precisely what you're talking about is where we must get, but the arc is going to be very long. You know, the, 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 where we need to get in US-China relations, um, it entails change that is very, very difficult. We only manage this peacefully uh, if China re-embraces reform and becomes truly committed to being an integrated nation that participates in modernity. Not modernization as defined by the four modernizations, which is about technological, material, economic well-being, but modernity. And we only get to where we need to be if the United States uh, finds a way, changes, and finds a way to see itself as one large, interesting nation among others and is willing to set aside aspects of the exceptionalism that are very, very deeply ingrained in American political culture and American culture generally. That is to say, where we need to get, we need both nations, as Adam, your, your question suggests, to, to set aside a big part of their self-concept and a sense of exceptionalism and to truly embrace a form of multilateralism, which is also modern in the, in the sense of modernity, not Chinese, uh, but with, and modernity, embraces, you know, frankly, enlightenment values, what matters, you know, was talking about. That is where we need to get, but boy, is that difficult in any instance for two highly self-regarding nations. It's hard anyway, and we're going in the opposite direction right now in both countries. You know, Xi Jinping really is more repressive at home and more aggressive internationally. Uh, and the United States is deeply divided. And right now, uh, the more hawkish approach to what the United States should be um, and to what, and the hawkish description of what China is and how China must be opposed, that's gaining steam. 
Yeah, so, so I'm gonna, um, so we have some questions that kind of touch on that one from um, uh, Ho Feng Hang. Uh, so the question is, you know, kind of relating to what you're just saying, how much is the intensifying rivalry between the US and China a function of the particular leadership in the two countries? What, how would a change of leadership in either country, more likely the US, would or would not change the trajectory? Uh, I think that the leadership uh, in both countries has greatly exacerbated a problem that preceded Xi Jinping and Donald Trump. Uh, we, are, we are where we are in the main for historic and structural reasons. And these have been, I think, broadly described uh, under the Graham Allison Thucydides trap rubric, which in some ways I, I dislike uh, because these kinds of macro historical dynamics, um, you know, Mearsheimer looks at it from a more strictly realist way, but they come to the same conclusion. And when you, when you say that these problems are historic and structural, the, the problem with that is it tends to eliminate any uh, space for human agency in, in solving these problems. Um, but I, nevertheless, there's, you know, the United States is for the first time facing a peer competitor with very different values. It's very ambitious. We have incommensurate interests in some cases. And so the, the, a much more contentious relationship, a rivalry was in the cards, uh, regardless of the advent of Xi Jinping or Donald Trump, uh, both of whom have made it much worse. If we elect uh, Biden in the summer, uh, I think that, that the historical structural element of this is not going to go away. I think that uh, relations will continue to worsen. And per the first question, there are some senses in which you can argue that they should worsen because there are real geostrategic you know, conflicts here. But I think that with Biden, uh, you would get a more traditional approach to foreign affairs, which would be more predictable. There would be less uncertainty. In the Trump administration, you see an administration sort of at war with itself, and even a president who has uh, some s instincts toward China, which point, point him toward being um, accommodationist and transactional, and he has other instincts uh, which point towards something more like a Cold War rivalry, and, and we tend to waver between the two of them. So I think that a, a Biden administration would bring in more expertise and would enable and rebuild an expert bureaucracy, which is essential, and that you'd also get less uncertainty. But the nature of the relationship, the nature of the issue, I don't think is terribly likely to change in the short term because of a change of leaders. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> you know, we have a question from Michael John that kind of touches on that, you know, do you believe that you know, viewing the current US and China relationship through the framework of a quote unquote new Cold War is valid? And if so, in your opinion, what foreign policies are required to deescalate tensions and build more mutual cooperation? I think you just touched on that a little bit, but you know. Yeah, I still, I, I resist saying Cold War, but it's, it's getting harder to, and it, and it may be uh, that even though I think that that is a misleading and unhelpful historical analogy, it could very well be that the world at large seizes on that as, as the term that we're going to use uh, as, as a new Cold War. I, I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, and I think that the, the differences have been written about and discussed pretty widely. You know, the Soviet Union was uh, a military power and a military peer competitor, which was able to leverage its military might into growing political influence. But it was never an economic uh, competitor of the United States. It wasn't a soft power. Uh, competitor of the United States. Um, so, it's, so the Cold War analogy is, is inaccurate in that regard. Um, it's also inaccurate in that we were never very highly integrated uh, with the Soviet Union. They, they had their own separate uh, sphere. We had a separate sphere, but we are highly integrated with China. And we really have derived considerable benefit from that integration. And it's not at all clear, you know, how you can decouple when the US and China, you know, becoming one system, it's like becoming one body. And how do you, how do you tear the body apart without unacceptable costs? Um, on the other hand, the, the Cold War analogy reminds us, and this is one of the, I think one of the basic mistakes that we make um, in our China policy now. Uh, and I think that China makes it probably to a lesser extent than America makes it. Uh, but the Cold War analogy reminds us that we, we can't fight. We mustn't go to war. And what you see in Washington now 
as we struggle to form a China policy and a China strategy, which we have so far failed to do, is we are sort of trying to reason from the many things we object to about China and its behavior and its power. And most of those objections are legitimate and I share them, you know, in many cases, uh, very strongly. We try to reason from all the things that we dislike about China in the context of our mutual integration and reliance toward a coherent workable policy that has definable goals and that is achievable and, and, and we can't get there. And anger and distrust are growing. What we're not doing is reasoning backward, meaning starting from something that we do agree on, namely that we mustn't go to war with each other because that's Armageddon, that's World War III, starting from that in, in a more Cold War way of thinking and reasoning backwards. Or how can we guarantee that that doesn't happen? And if, if we mustn't go to war with each other and we accept that, maybe we shouldn't uh, re-invoke mutual assured destruction and shouldn't be entering into a new arms race, which comprises not only nukes, but cyber weapons and space weapons, which we haven't begun to understand. Nobody is, is, is reasoning backward. We need some of that um, in our China policy. Um, I think that what I'd like to see in China policy is what I've already described, which is a global diplomacy, very active, uh, which is aimed at um, preventing an arms race, preventing Chinese dominance of the Western Pacific or Asia, preventing Chinese dominance, while recognizing China's very legitimate interests and the need for more, for China to have more space, working with allies to do that. Um, and we also need to uh, combat really hard the spread of Chinese Communist Party illiberalism uh, globally. And we need to do that, I say, fight it hard, call it as we see it. Um, that's the sort of policy we need, but it doesn't have a defined endpoint. This is gonna be going on for decades in what is essentially um, a play for time, hoping that China continues to change. And I think that the hardliners in America have forgotten that the story of modern China is a story of change. And it remains a story of change. Uh, China hasn't stopped evolving. She can't really wholly control where it goes. Um, and so, you know, per Adam's point about the need for both nations to set aside some of their long-term, not only strategic concepts, but self-concepts and cultural concepts. If that's where we need to get, then it needs to be uh, a play for time uh, rather than uh, a strategy that aims at defeating the evil empire now. I know that's very broad, but that's all we can do at this point. Great. So kind of following up on that, a question from Professor Paul Armstrong Taylor um, at the HNC. Is U.S. policy anti-China or anti-CCP, or more specifically anti the C administration? I think that it is possible to be pro-China and disapprove of the C administration just as it is possible to be pro-America and not support the Trump administration. This is a really tough one. Um, and both countries always strive to say uh, that it's the government of the other country that we oppose and not the people. And of course, you, you, you want to make that distinction. You don't want to oppose the people. On the other hand, that, those kinds of formulations are far too simple because forms of governance emerge from cultures. You know, there's the saying in English that we have the government we deserve. So does China. China also has the government it deserves. In China, as in the United States, many people disapprove of many things their government does. They're very critical. Uh, and yet they still have the government they deserve. I, you may have gathered, uh, am not a supporter of the current president. But I don't deny that he's wholly American. You know, he's American to the core. Uh, it's just that he happens to represent the quintessence of aspects of America that, that I don't care for. And I would argue that the same thing is true about Xi Jinping. So uh, the question is very important, but it's, it's very hard to answer. I think that we delude ourselves when we say it's just the government or it's just Xi, and it's not something more broadly about China. You know, we've heard recently both Vice President Pence and Secretary of State Pompeo in trying to make this distinction. They said, you know, the people of China are either imprisoned or enslaved by the Chinese government. Now, we don't have polling on this in China and we don't have elections, so you're stuck with anecdotal personal experience, but I've actually got a lot of anecdotal personal experience in China over 33 years. And I'm pretty sure that most Chinese do not feel imprisoned or enslaved. Some do, it's true, um, but I don't think most of them do. And so when they hear American leaders saying that, 
their response is not the desired one of, oh, the American leaders understand us and they're defending us from our government. The response is, these guys don't know what they're talking about. And this is a, a delusion that, that Americans are particularly prone to. I, I think of it as, as the Dorothy delusion. It's, it's very morally self-flattering. And the idea is, you remember at the end of The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy is in the witch's castle and, and she accidentally throws the water on the witch um, when she's trying to put out the scarecrow who's been set on fire and the witch melts. Um, and then there are all these big guys with droopy mustaches and, and halberds, the, the guards in the witch's palace. She says, she's dead, you killed her. And they say, hail Dorothy, right? Well, Americans love this idea that if we can get into the castle and throw water in the form of liberal, the truths of liberalism and liberal democracy on the witch, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party, that the Chinese people will say, hail Dorothy, but they're not gonna say hail Dorothy. They say, you know, she may be a witch, but she's our witch. What are you doing in the castle? And then that, that's bad for Dorothy because they say they have sharp halberds. So I, I'm not sure I struggle with this question a lot. I, I don't think you can make a clear distinction, um, even though you have to try to make these points that it is ideas and values and actions of the Communist Party and not China, you know, qua China that we object to but we can deceive ourselves with that. I'd, I'd be interested in views from the audience on this. I, I go back and forth on this question. Very yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> so this is a kind of a little change, a change of pace. Um, it's from one of our certificate students, um, international certificate students. What do you predict about the prospects for us emerging US-China scholars slash professionals? Will there be opportunities for us in either the country or will both be closed off? This is getting much, much more difficult uh, in both countries for some related reasons and some different reasons. Things have already changed greatly in China uh, from the way that it was when I was at the Hopkins Nanjing Center. You know, it used to be that for our students, uh, and at that point, I, I, my, my last year there was the first year of, of the dual masters. So most of them were still certificate students. And the typical pattern uh, for many, many years, and I, get, I, hope, I don't know if Milo's still on the line, but he knows about this as well, uh, is that you get uh, American and international students who would do undergraduate Chinese studies uh, and maybe have some study abroad experience, who would then come to the Hopkins Nanjing Center and, and really drill down on getting professional competency uh, in the language. And then in the old days, you could just kind of, under Chinese visa law, you could just hang in China. Right? You'd go to Shanghai, you'd go to Beijing, or you'd go to some other city, and uh, you would maybe work for a few startups, and you'd do some TV commercials, and you'd start your own company, and you'd fail, and you would just sort of be hanging uh, for you know, two, three, five years, strengthening your Chinese language abilities, your, uh, deepening your understanding of the country, making Chinese friends. Then you'd go back to the States, you'd get a law degree or a business degree, um, but that, that just hanging in China would become a, really the foundation, those were your glory days uh, of your China career, whether you became a diplomat or a lawyer or a business person. You can't do that in China anymore. Uh, you've got new visa laws that, you know, Adam can, you know, knows more about than I do, but it, it, it cuts off that just hanging out opportunity. Uh, in America, you know, Chinese students who come here can do OPT training for a year, they can get jobs, but that's really getting harder and harder more than want to go back. So I'm afraid that the avenues are getting fewer and further between and more difficult to navigate. Um, but I still think that what you're doing, the HNC, the certificate program, for all the reasons I've described, it's actually more important than ever. It's harder to see perhaps how it pans out professionally. But you know, when I was at the HNC, what I, what I used to say at the opening ceremony was, you know, you guys in being here, you've, you, you've got the privilege of participating in one of history's greatest, most consequential conversations. You know, this grinding up against each other, the United States and China, what does this mean and where does this go? This is one of history's great conversations. And by being at the HNC, you're being trained to be the most adept practitioners of that conversation because you're working in a target language and you're working with each other and you're getting to know each other. How that plays out professionally, we don't know, we never knew. It's getting tougher. Um, so I, but, but stay the course because you know, we, we need you and it's gonna be more important than ever, even if it's harder to see 
how you're going to navigate a career that's sort of Jungmei, hopping back and forth be between the two. I, I do think that's going to get considerably more difficult and it, for scholars as well as you know, people in the professions or people in business. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, so let's see. Uh, next question. Uh, there have been misinformation campaigns going on in both the US and China regarding the handling of COVID-19. What is your view on China's handling of the virus? And do you think other countries will in any way retaliate against China due to its perceived mishandling of the virus? So um, there's no question but that China grossly mishandled the virus. Uh, perhaps as early as November, but certainly December, January, February. Again, this, this is widely known and understood, including by the Chinese people. Uh, the, the Chinese people are, are very understandably, rightly celebrating what seems to be you know, the end of the epidemic within China. And they have suffered for that, they've paid for that, they'll continue to pay for that. And so it's, it's completely appropriate that they celebrate that. And I know that there is also a lot of, of pride in the fact that China is now the primary source of masks and test kits and medical equipment uh, to the rest of the world in the sense that you know, China can provide you know, public goods and, and that's, that's also fine. But the, the mishandling was enormous was consequential. It was characteristic uh, of the Communist Party, the sorts of cover-ups. Um, you know, Milo and I were in China all through to, you know, spring of 2003 with SARS, so we, we saw this then uh, firsthand. And that was consequential and that shouldn't be forgotten. And I think that China is going to pay um, long-term indirect costs for that. People will be more hesitant to go to China. Uh, it's going to increase various kinds of decoupling, all of which will have costs for China. And that needs, and so the, the China's mishandling of it needs to be remembered. However, uh, I have a couple of objections, strong objections, to the way that, that this blame of China is now being uh, played out and played upon uh, in the United States, where we hear calls for Peiquan, uh, for China to indemnify everybody who's been harmed by this, for calls for recriminations um, and the claims that there's this UK study that claims that had China acted in certain ways early on, 95% of infection uh, could have been prevented. I'm not obviously not qualified to comment on that one study, but it's the one study that's been seized upon here. So there, there, there are at least three problems with this. One um, is that this is a fallen world and there are always going to be problems. There are going to be subsequent pandemics. They're all going to originate somewhere. And we've, you know, the global community has never been in the business of assigning blame to the one country of origin and demanding reparations. Things just can't work that way. The world doesn't work that way. Um, not a perfect analogy, but the 2008 financial crisis, that was, that originated in the United States. It was a complicated phenomenon, but it was more or less our fault. Um, and it had a negative impact on a great many other nations. And they made this point and they were snarky about it. Um, but there weren't demands for reparations. I, mean, I just don't think the global system can function that way in a world in which there are always going to be problems. That, that's, that's one issue. The second issue with these growing demands, um, I just saw Lindsey Graham was just on Hannity about this. Um, Bill Maher just did a long piece on real time on this last night. Uh, while yes, uh, it would be, China is covering up, continues to cover up the way that it mishandled that. Chen Chou Shi uh, has been disappeared and is still in prison. Uh, Ren Zhengfei has been locked up. Xu Zhang Run, scholars, journalists. It's not just that they covered up um, the numbers initially and may still be covering them up and that they silence doctors. They're still silencing critics. So all these negative things are true. On the other hand, we know perfectly well that China is never going to accept blame or admit wrongdoing. And we know that they're never going to directly pay recriminations, although they will be hurt by this for a long time. So it's just not good policy to have a policy goal that you know at the starting gate cannot succeed. You know that calls for recriminate for, for, for pay quan and, and, and indemnification are only going to increase anger and misunderstanding and close down conversation and cooperation going forward. And, and part of these calls are also um, clearly uh, a smoke screen to distract from 
our own mishandling, and in particular the president's uh, approach to coronavirus. Like the WHO, he was praising uh, Xi Jinping fulsomely uh, early, you know, January and February for loving his people and managing this well. And then the, the, then the other real problem with this claim is that implicit in this blame China discourse is the claim that had China been perfect, wholly and perfectly transparent, we of course would have been wholly wise and perfectly strategic in our response. And we know that to be false. It's demonstrably false when you look at when America knew what it knew, what the president said, when we actually went into you know, an emergency situation. So it's, it's, it's a false narrative and it's clearly false. Americans know it's false, China knows it's false, the world knows it's false. Um, this claim that had, we're trying to wholly transparent, we'd be wholly strategic and wise. So uh, I don't like where the, 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 the blame narrative points us in more destructive directions. That said, I'm not making excuses for China. There is tremendous uh, blame and we should fight back against denial of that and we should fight back against conspiracy theories on both sides. Great, that's really interesting. Um, another question, if the relationship continues to worsen and we slip into another quote unquote Cold War, do you, you think that China is capable of producing their own Gorbachev and that will be able to negotiate a peaceful end to a new era of full spectrum competition that we seem to be entering? We, um, yeah, China's capable of a great many things. I don't, I don't see it under Xi Jinping and under Xi Jinping uh, that could go on for a very long time. Uh, but as I've said already, the story of modern China is the story of change and adaptation on a scale and at a speed uh, that has never been seen before. It's tremendously impressive. And, you know, having been, had the fortune to, you know, live in China and be involved with China, um, you know, really since 1986, uh, I've been just hugely and continually impressed by the capacity for adap you know, adaptation of, of the Chinese people. Uh, so yes, it's, you know, certainly it's possible. I don't see a ready path from where we are today to that place. And as I said, we need change in the United States as well. But yeah, China's um, just a wonderfully adaptive, uh, dynamic place. And you know, to me, the story of the past, you know, 45 years has been that, you know, anytime the party's grip was loosened such that the Chinese people had more scope to determine and pursue their own interests, uh, their response has been, you know, sort of marvelous and 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 earth changing, and that can continue to happen. I I, I don't think the story's over. Uh, I don't think China has stopped changing, and that it's now this you know monolith moving in one direction. Okay, we have a few questions. I think one that was answered in your question about coronavirus. Um, I guess we have one last written question, and then Adam, if you want to just <clears throat> maybe you can ask a final question to. You know, we're already almost at 90 minutes. So the final written question is what kind of decoupling uh, we are facing right now? Do you think it's full decoupling or is it more selective? Uh, which one do you think is more important in decision-making in, in this digital age, flexibility or principle? Uh, I'm gonna borrow something here from Dan Rosen at the Rhodium Group. Um, if you don't know the Rhodium Group's work in New York, uh, I recommend that you look at it. They've got a study coming out soon and in, in, within the next month or two in which they're trying to look at um, what the real costs of decoupling would be, you know, to force us to confront what we're talking about here. Rosen's phrase is that decoupling uh, is already deep, it's ongoing, and it's strategically necessary. It's a proper response. But, he says, it should be partial, provisional, meaning it can be rolled back, and peaceful. That's the way he thinks about it. So yes, decoupling, a strategic necessity in America's interest, but partial, provisional, and peaceful. And I think that's as good a broad way of thinking about it um, as, you, as I've run into anyway. I guess a final question I um, ask is, um, HNC I think is a microcosm of this, but you know, both societies and Chinese society in particular are less self-contained than they were. You have a huge Chinese diaspora now, um, people who have been educated abroad, I mean, the, the interests of people who are well off in China have become much more globalized in a sense. I wonder how 
at that level of society you see this um, playing out or what the, the forces for, for engagement are in society compared to what they would have been say 20 years ago? So I, I mentioned internationally that I think, you know, maybe multilateralism uh, saves us. This is one of the um, dynamics that's on the positive side of the ledger. And broadly speaking, I think that this, you know, large populations, especially in China, but also in the United States, of people who are internationalized, uh, who have uh, experience in each other's countries, who have studied each other's language, who have worked together uh, in various capacities, um, you know, who have had careers that have them hopscotching back and forth, uh, and in particular, uh, Chinese Americans of, many, you know, and that's a very complex community and people who come from Taiwan and Hong Kong and mainland China and who've come in different waves and different historical periods, and sort of very distinct communities. Nevertheless, they are really sort of a gugan lilian, a real, I think, pillar of potential understanding and collaboration uh, that can speak against this mutual alienation and mutual demonization that we see as ongoing. Um, and this is why we need to cooperate when we can and need and why engagement, a limited, a different kind of engagement, needs to remain a, a pillar of the relationship and why places like the HNC are so important. You know, understanding the other culture doesn't mean <laughs> to any degree that you're going to agree with everything the culture that that country wants. You know, we're very proud of American soft power in China. People wear blue jeans, they eat at McDonald's, they have nationwide, you know, hip hop uh, competitions. Does this mean that, you know, these people who are very internationalized and knowledgeable about America agree with our position in the South China Sea? No, of course not. Uh, but what it does mean is that it's people with that kind of experience, it's much harder for propagandists in either country to, you know, to, to, to defame or blacken or, or propagandize the other. Um, engagement and the kinds of study that you all are doing inoculates you against dangerous and potentially violent, simplistic narratives. And I think that that's extremely important. And these you know, populations that, 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 Adam, that you're describing, I think are one of the places that we need to look um, for hope. In, in a situation in which there, there aren't a lot of sources of it. I, I don't see a lot of bright spots that you've gathered uh, in the relationship right now. Okay, on that somewhat more positive note then. Um, so th thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, for attending. And, and thank you, Robert, for this, this very interesting overview of a whole wide range of issues that touch not only on big global questions, but also um, HNC very specifically. So thank you for, for coming. Thank you and good luck in your studies. Thanks, Robert. Thanks.